Bob Perry, thanks for joining us on this special devoted to scandals of the Reagan-Bush era. We know that uh, you as a reporter for the Associated Press and other organizations, Newsweek, were involved uh, very intimately in breaking the Iran-Contra scandal, and uh, we want to spend some time on that and why we don't know perhaps as much as we should about that scandal. You are the author of a book, Fooling America, and one of the key focuses of that book is uh, you focus in on what you call conventional wisdom in Washington, D.C., and how it seems to undermine how a uh, people's concern with being in or out undermines the nature of the story, the nature of how we hear stories and what is or isn't reported. So let's talk a little bit about uh, just life in Washington and what it means this conventional wisdom has meant to some of these scandals that you have attempted to report. But first of all, why don't you define a little bit about what you mean by conventional wisdom? Well, I would say that, that Washington is a place of great conformity. It's a city um, where people want to be respected, want to be seen as insiders, want to be seen uh, as the kind of uh, people that can get jobs and be s and get to the right uh, parties, be be respected. That's a very important part of uh, of being a, a a reporter in Washington, a, a congressman in Washington, a bureaucrat in Washington, a lobbyist in Washington. So with that, there's this great danger that when you go against the grain, when you're a maverick, when you take on powerful interests, when you challenge what the official story is, the official truth is, uh, that you become a person who steps outside of the acceptable parameters, uh, that you're no longer taken seriously, your career may be put in jeopardy. If you're a member of Congress, you'll be considered a, a lightweight, a flake. Uh, you're not part of the club. Uh, so in, in Washington, there is this uh, almost a conf an, an enforced reality on people, which I would call the conventional wisdom. It's a consensus of of the most uh, the most powerful and influential uh, people in the city. If you take that that kind of phony or f or enforced reality on, you run tremendous risks for yourself. Uh, if you're a member of Congress, uh, say in the case of when John Kerry back in the mid '80s took on the Iran Contra, or then then known as the North Network story. Uh, he was ridiculed as believing uh, these crazy conspiracy theories. He was discredited uh, for, uh, for trusting witnesses who were just uh, low-life mercenaries. Uh, he was uh, attacked uh, by what we now know were manufactured uh, prosecutorial reports, say, from Florida, which, which claimed there was nothing to this, even when the investigators were actually discovering in Florida that there was a great deal to these North allegations. He suffered badly in terms of his career, in terms of his reputation. He did this, had the same problem on the Contra drug story when he was insisting about that there was strong evidence of that. It, that was not part of the official reality of Washington. It was not part of the conventional wisdom. And to go against that kind of uh, enforced reality, um, is not the kind of thing that most people in Washington will do because they have to care about their jobs, about, uh, about being influential inside the political structures of the city. Uh, so often the truth is left behind in favor of, of being, uh, being part of the club. I've heard it said that um, from editors and publishers and haunters and networks that um, the reason that uh, there isn't investigative reporting or more investigative reporting is not because people are afraid of stories, but it just costs too much money. We're not afraid of being cast out. We just can't afford to do it anymore. Well, there probably is something to that. I think investigative reporting can be expensive and somewhat risky. Um, there was, I believe, a strategy undertaken in the post-Watergate period by by political groups, I say particularly on the conservative side, who were hostile to reporting that was exposing wrongdoing like Watergate. Uh, part of that strategy was to mount uh, aggressive uh, libel actions against journalists who stepped outside the bounds, uh, CBS for instance on the Westmoreland case. And by driving the costs or the perceived costs of investigative reporting up, through those kinds of pr proceedings, it had an effect on intimidating uh, publishers and editors. But I would say beyond that, there really is uh, a great fear and timidity on the part of editors and publishers. Much, many of the stories that 
we were doing on the North Network operations, the Contra drugs, were not stories that were going to lead you into particular libel situations. These were ac about actions of the U.S. government. Um, uh, the, the concern there was that the, that the news organizations pushing these stories forward would be attacked. And in an, on an individual basis, the reporter who was crazy enough to try to get at the truth on these would be singled out and attacked. Uh, and there developed a whole bureaucracy uh, in Washington during that period called public diplomacy, uh, which was designed by the White House with the specific intent of, of raising the price for people who were not going along with the official story. Now, could you talk a little bit more about that structure? Uh, you talk a little bit about it in your book, about this structure created as uh, Reagan came in, Reagan Bush came in, to make sure uh, that uh, conventional wisdom was what they felt it to be and how they went about enforcing uh, the situation so that things came out uh, looking the way they wanted them to look. Well. Uh, for those of us who were doing these kinds of stories uh, f throughout the 80s, uh, it was something that we were aware of. Uh, you can almost not be unaware of it. Uh, w uh, at the Associated Press, I was assigned to their special assignment team uh, with the transition from Carter to Reagan. So I, was, so I was doing investigative reporting in that sense from the very beginning of the Reagan era. Uh, those of us who would take on some of the misstatements of President Reagan, say, at news conferences, would find ourselves under attacks, as the news organizations did. Um, AP, uh, and after the first news conference that Reagan uh, put on, uh, did a story about a number of factual errors. Uh, AP was then severely counterattacked by David Gergen and others uh, through the media. There were also groups like Accuracy in Media, conservative uh, pressure groups, which were specifically designed to intimidate reporters in the news media from exposing problems uh, like errors of fact by the president or actions he was taking that they liked, but the public uh, was being uh, was they were being sheltered from the public. Um, so, a as the '80s got underway, this was more or less ad hoc. Uh, there were efforts to uh, attack certain journalists. Ray Bonner, for instance, when he was exposing death squad activity by American allied forces in El Salvador. He came under severe and coordinated attack by the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador, by the White House here, the State Department, and by these conservative pressure groups. Uh, the attacks became so intense that ultimately the New York Times withdrew him and his career basically ended at the New York Times. Uh, so there were those ad hoc kind of approaches. But then we saw, beginning around 82, 83, a much more coordinated strategy. And from the documents that came out during the Iran-Contra hearings, we now know a good deal about that, and I go into it in my book at great length. There was a, a strategy called public diplomacy, uh, and, it, and one of the fathers of that strategy was William Casey, who was then at CIA. In 83, Casey had some serious problems. The Contra operation was not working as he'd intended. Uh, the plans to overthrow the Sandinistas in Nicaragua by the end of 83, which was the original timetable, were obviously pie in the sky. Uh, the Contras were committing a, a large number of atrocities, which Congress was beginning to look into and becoming concerned about. Uh, so Casey had to, in a sense, shape the image of the Contras in Washington, even more importantly than in the field. Uh, he had to make them seem more effective on one level. That's one reason they did some of the minings and it coastal attacks. They were actually done by CIA personnel, but instead of it being acknowledged by CIA, the Contras were supposed to claim false, falsely credit for those operations. Then in Washington, uh, Casey and others at the White House put together uh, a public diplomacy apparatus. Uh, they brought over from CIA Walter Raymond, who was the top propagandist at CIA for a number of years. He'd been there, he had a long, long career at the agency running propaganda and disinformation. He was put in charge of this domestic program at the National Security Council because the CIA is by law prohibited from influencing American policies and politics. So he was in effect externalized from the CIA as we saw North was later in a similar fashion. So you had, uh, so you had this operation built inside the NSC which had an office at the State Department run by a man named Otto Reich, who was a Cuban-American who was extremely uh, aggressively conservative on these kinds of issues. Uh, 
And they went around trying to intimidate journalists and their editors and their news executives around Washington. Uh, whenever a story appeared that they didn't like, uh, the reporters and editors could expect uh, a lengthy visit where every detail in the story would be challenged, the reporter's objectivity would be questioned, there'd be pressure on, on editors to reassign the reporter. Uh, there was also a strategy which they called controversializing reporters, that is by dragging a reporter into the story and making him sort of part of it by saying he was biased and so forth, by attacking him publicly, you could controversialize the reporter and therefore convince his editor that he could no longer be an objective reporter, therefore he had to be pulled. So you had a variety of strategies like that. Could you give an example of, a, of a, perhaps a reporter yourself or somebody who was marginalized like that? Well, it happened to a, to a lot of us. Um, and there are some rather, uh, I think, rather shocking examples. There was one when uh, John Lantigua of the Washington Post, uh, was, I think, a stringer for them in, in, uh, in Central America, was doing stories out of Nicaragua, which were quite accurate, but which the administration didn't like. The story was put out through the Public Diplomacy Office and through Accuracy in Media uh, that Lantigua and others, uh, other reporters in, in Managua, were accepting prostitutes from the Sandinistas. And, uh, and Reich added this little touch that, uh, that for, for gay reporters, the Sandinistas were providing men. Uh, it, was, it was the kind of thing you do to somebody, and, you, and, and therefore, when you put this out publicly, you uh, make it harder for them to do their jobs, quite obviously. The next time they, they do a story, their editors are going to be more suspect, even if they don't believe the allegations, it's out there. Um, the reporter has to deny them. The pressure on the reporter then becomes to then prove that he is not in the Sandinista's pocket, so to speak. So he then has to attack the Sandinista's, perhaps, perhaps do journalism that's not accurate, that maybe is, uh, uh, is more biased because he has to prove himself back to Washington that he's really an anti-Sandinista kind of fellow. Um, these were very sophisticated public relations tactics, somewhat, somewhat crude, but in many ways sophisticated. Uh, there were also attempts on the case of my colleague at the Associated Press during the mid-80s, Brian Barger. I received a call from uh, someone on the public diplomacy staff at State who tried to convince me that Barger was a Sandinista agent. Um, it was the kind of thing they were whispering about us around the city. Uh, I demanded evidence. It turned out they didn't have any. Uh, they, they, they threw, the guy threw out something. He said, uh, interestingly, that uh, Barger had done pieces for Pacifica, uh, and that that meant that he was somehow a Sandinista agent. Uh, I said, well, no, he, he, actually did a, he actually did some stories for Pacific News Service, which is a different organization. Uh, they then said that uh, he had worked for Karen DeYoung at the Washington Post, and they didn't like Karen DeYoung because she had reported on the Sandinistas taking power in 79. Uh, and which was true, but Karen DeYoung was the, was the foreign editor when Barger was a, a staffer and an editorial assistant on the foreign desk. It didn't mean anything. But, these were the, but by saying this, whispering these kinds of accusations, even when they had absolutely no basis, uh, the effect was to frighten reporters, and if you didn't frighten them, to raise questions about them. Now, you also, getting back to this, this crew and uh, sort of putting the CIA in place essentially to do domestic policy, you talked uh, in your book about Raymond and the, the desire to, um, I think you called it black hatting, white hatting and black hatting, uh, uh, making the good and the bad very clear, the black and the white very precise. Well, of course, when you ask these uh, people in the, in the, in the Reagan-Bush administrations about this, they deny that they were doing propaganda. But the documents that we had show that Raymond had, had a special uh, set of marching orders for his staff, and they were to glue, in his words, glue black hats on the Sandinistas and to glue white hats on the Contras. Now, this is, in a sense, the, almost the definition of propaganda. Uh, if, if, if your instructions were, let's get the truth out, fellas, the American people deserve it, you wouldn't be telling them to glue black hats on one side and to glue white hats on the other. They understood that this was a case where both sides were in gray hats, that there was a lot of ambiguity about this, that the, uh, 
The issue was much more complicated, uh, but they did not want to present it to the American people in that way. They were doing what they used to call perception management. And the idea was that if they could manage the perceptions of, of, of Central America among the American people, and particularly among the elite in Washington, they could then shape their policies and, and get approval for the war efforts they were undertaking um, by putting out essentially distorted or false information. And that worked for them. They, they did not really care about the reality in Central America. They, they cared about the perception of reality among the, the elite in Washington. And by attacking anyone who disagreed with them and marginalizing those people, they helped build a conventional wisdom or a consensus in Washington that, was, that looked the other way when the Contras committed uh, atrocities and uh, flew into a rage when the Sandinistas did. Uh, it became a very one-sided approach. And some of the accusations against the Sandinistas turned out to be utterly made up whole cloth. Would this be the same organization that operated, for instance, around the uh, case of Barry Seal, uh, who was working with the DEA and was about to, according to the DEA, uh, participate in a major bust uh, relating to Colombian traffickers? And apparently the Reagan administration wanted to show that drug trafficking was going on in Nicaragua. And so do you know this story? Does this come sure. in? Sure. Yes, this is, this is an example I was just about to raise. The there were a number of public relations propaganda strategies run against the Sandinistas. Uh, many of them were completely false. Uh, one of them uh, was this one, this, this allegation uh, which ro arose in 1984 that the Sandinistas were shipping cocaine to the United States and that it was poisoning American youth, as President Reagan said in one of his public addresses. Well, what happened there is that in reality, the Drug Enforcement Administration did not have a single shred of evidence that the Sandinista leadership was doing any such thing. What they did do, and this was a, a joint White House-CIA operation, was that they, they arranged to have uh, a shipment of cocaine put on a plane, the, a C-123, that was flown by Barry Seal, who was a DEA informant, he flew it into Nicaragua. Uh, the plane was, uh, was shot down. Then another plane was brought in to pick up, to transfer the cocaine from one plane to the other, and it was flown out. Uh, although this was part of a larger operation aimed at major drug traffickers in South America, uh, the White House and CIA leaked this information to the press, particularly to the Washington Times, and it, and it was made into, into a major story about the Sandinista leadership being involved in drug trafficking. There was one man named Federico Vaughn who was a, a very sh shady character. No one quite knows who he was working for, but apparently he had some ties to the Sandinista government. But he also, according to later evidence, was making his phone calls to the United States about this from either the, a U.S. embassy phone or the a phone of another Western um, country. So the, who exactly Mr. Vaughn was working for was never made entirely clear, but it was a very effective propaganda ploy. The DEA had acknowledged later that it did not have a single bit of evidence tying any other Sandinista official to drug trafficking. They were aware of not a single shipment of cocaine from Nicaragua to the United States during this period. And, and, I, and that is not because I think the Sandinistas were particularly moral people. I, but it was, it had to do a great deal with the economics of the matter. It would be, an, it would be absolutely certifiably insane for a, a drug smuggler from South America to move his drugs through Nicaragua to the United States for a couple of reasons. One, the U.S. had imposed a strict trade embargo on Nicaragua and was not allowing shipments to come in of, of many sorts. Uh, and secondly, the U.S. had Nicaragua under extremely close surveillance. There was, this, the, there was the, the, the story in Washington that if a toilet flushed in Nicaragua, the CIA knew about it. Uh, so, you had, so you had really no logical reason for these shipments to go through Nicaragua. They went instead through Costa Rica, Honduras, and, and other countries in the region. But 
the DEA acknowledged that none of them went through Nicaragua as far as they knew. And in fact, they were quite disturbed because this did, this desire to nail the, the Sandinistas did screw up a major drug operation. Right. The, the, the drug operation, which was aimed at some of the top uh, cocaine traffickers in, in, uh, in Colombia, was disrupted by this, uh, by this propaganda ploy, which was essentially false but had a very telling effect on the American image, again, gluing black hats on the Sandinistas. This is Dennis Bernstein. We're speaking with Bob Perry. He's the author of Fooling America, and this is a special devoted to scandals of the Reagan-Bush era. Well, this brings us back to your book again, and let me ask you this question. Uh, one, is this sort of typical policy, and how does this desire to... Uh, alter conventional wisdom and uh, make policy ha look uh, as the way a particular administration wants it to look. How does that undermine our democracy? You know, this is a sort of a speculative question. And what impact does it have on uh, democracy with a small day? Well, democracy, I think, has to be defined as uh, as an informed electorate um, having a say in the actions of their government. If the electorate is disinformed or uninformed, democracy is diminished and, and potentially made meaningless. Uh, I think if one could look at a, a totalitarian state, for instance, which had complete control over the information flow and prevented um, uh, any uh, honest information from getting out and then still had elections, the elections wouldn't really amount to much. Uh, obviously, that's not the case here. But the degree to which the federal government, the executive branch, was able to mislead the public, to provide false information, misleading information, propaganda, if you will, to the public, democracy is diminished. The public cannot be expected to act in an informed manner if the government is disinforming it. Do you believe that this policy has changed uh, the way in which journalists uh, work in a permanent way? Do you think this has really altered the nature of journalism and investigative reporting and journalists' desire to get to the truth? Yes. I, I don't think that you'll see in Washington, at least, uh, it's hard to say what will happen in the new administration, but I, I think what we've seen happen over the last 12 years in Washington is, uh, uh, is almost a, um, uh, a fear a terror almost among journalists to go against the prevailing wisdom, the conventional wisdom, or against what the government, what the White House wants reported. Uh, too many people have had their careers badly damaged. Too many people have been literally purged from our profession. Um, many of the many of the journalists who succeeded in the 80s, who are now reaching positions as bureau chiefs or news executives, did so because they intentionally avoided taking on the government. They did not want to, they, were, they had so little commitment to finding out the truth that they were willing to play along with some of the most uh, obvious lies of this past era. So they're now in a position to, to do the hiring, the firing, the, uh, the decisions on assignments, the decisions on what stories are worth pursuing. So in a sense you've elevated a kind of a yuppie journalism to uh, positions of power in Washington. You're not finding the Bill Koviches, uh these days. Bill Kovich uh, was the uh, uh, bureau chief for the New York Times for many years, went on to the Atlanta Constitution, and was eventually sort of pushed out of the profession. Uh, he had fought for some of the most important stories that came out in the 70s out of the uh, New York Times Bureau. He was one of the people that supported Cy Hirsch and Cy Hirsch's heroic work during that era. Uh, you're not finding people like that anymore. Uh, in fact, you're finding people who care about their careers so much that they would not jeopardize them by doing tough journalism. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, tough journalism, Bob Perry. Let's backtrack a little bit and uh, talk in some depth about Iran-Contra and what happened with the story, how you discovered it, attempted to get it out, and then what happened in the aftermath of that. And you did do some uh, great work on unraveling the Oliver and North Network, what was going on in, I guess it was a basement office of the, uh, the it wasn't the White House, it was the, uh, um, the, National, Security the, Na Council. the National Security Council. Um, 
Why don't you start by just giving us, uh, as precise as you can, but a definition of what you think Iran-Contra was. Uh, you know, what kind of scandal was it and what was it about? Well, I think Iran-Contra is probably a good way of looking at uh, it's a good term for this, although I think one has to see it broadly, a bit like you might see Watergate covering a whole range of abuses in the 70s, not just the break-in. Uh, Iran-Contra I th should cover um, much, many of the abuses in the early 80s, which involved uh, uh, in a, a war that was being fought illegally in Nicaragua, uh, covert operations being run throughout Central America, much, many of them in defiance of the laws. Um, rules being bent or broken in terms of sending military equipment to Guatemala at a time when its military um, was widely um, understood to be engaged in serious human rights violations. The same in El Salvador where um, uh, major atrocities were covered up uh, because it would not help the political situation in Washington if they were acknowledged. The El Mazote massacre being perhaps the clearest case. Uh, in terms of in Nicaragua, you had um, uh, the supporting of a, of a group of, um, of uh, insurgents, the Contras, who engaged almost systematically in, uh, in abuses, human rights abuses, raping of women, uh, even their own women troops. Um, uh, they were involved in shipments of drugs. They, they, they engaged in just what ha almost has to be called terrorism, and in fact, there was a Defense Intelligence Agency report early on which labeled the Contras a terrorist organization. So, so you had all that having to be hidden from the American people. The American people weren't going to support uh, uh, model commanders uh, in the Contra forces who were raping their own women soldiers at knife point, as happened. Uh, they weren't going to support uh, uh, the mowing down of, of farm workers in the fields of Nicaragua. So all that had to be covered up. And we had uh, put in place then this idea of the public diplomacy operation to conceal it, to, to push our hot buttons on, on questions about the Sandinistas where their faults could be exaggerated, sometimes even invented. So we had all this sort of this general uh, atmosphere of deception going on. Uh, and so it was perhaps understandable, almost natural, that when Congress finally stepped in and said enough is enough, uh, you're not going to get any more money for these programs, after the, particularly after the mining of the Nicaraguan harbors were exposed. Um, and this was, that was a case where, we, where the United States was clearly in direct violation of international law. Ultimately, the World Court would even condemn us for it. But Congress finally stepped in, but instead of accepting the law, even though we signed it, President Reagan chose uh, to circumvent it, to, to flout it. And he turned, as we know, uh, to his National Security Council staff, particularly Colonel North, uh, to carry out this continued war policy. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, how you discovered Oliver North and um, how you attempted to go about getting out the word and what happened when you started to talk about this story. Well, I when I first uh, when I started doing the investigative work for AP in 80, 80, late 80, early 81, I, I focused on Central America as one topic I thought would be very hot. I thought there'd be a lot going on there and it was worth covering. Uh, in doing that, mostly on El Salvador at first, and also dealing with some intelligence policies as they were evolving in the early Reagan years, I, I came upon uh, a fairly junior man at the time named Oliver North. Uh, and I first met him personally in 1983. Uh, there was we had a we had lunch together at the Hay Adams restaurant in um, in Washington, not far from the White House. And uh, North was quite clearly a very articulate, uh, ambitious fellow. Uh, you could even tell that in a brief meeting, he carried he conveyed a great deal of energy, uh, excitement for what he was doing. Um, Why did he want to have lunch with uh, a reporter when he was busy constructing? Uh, this huge and illegal network? Well, at this point, this is before that, this is 83, but he was already, uh, North was very effective in manipulating the press. People don't realize that he made himself a source for a number of journalists, uh, and by doing so, he got n a number of them to protect him. So when he was, um, even when his, uh, the stories were beginning to come out about his activities, 
Many news organizations would not write them because he was considered a valued source of information. And he also understood the, the, the importance of propaganda. Uh, so if he could put out his side of the story on background or off the record to reporters, there was a tendency um, uh, to, to not only ingratiate himself with the reporters, but get them to carry his water. Uh, so it worked, worked both ways. So you were talking about this meeting. So, so in, in this, at this lunch, he, was, he, was, he started telling this story. Uh, at that time, I, I was with another person that was a conservative activist who had helped set the lunch up. And, uh, and, and, the, and Commander Shuffleberger had recently been killed in, in, um, in El Salvador. He was the deputy uh, military um, uh, commander for the, for the uh, U.S. military group in El Salvador. And he had been assassinated by the rebels. And in that context, North began talking about how he and Shuffleberger just a short time before had been flying around El Salvador in a Piper Cub and had heard about uh, a battle underway down below, and uh, and and landed the plane to get a what they can what he called a fast after action report. And the plane supposedly la landed, and uh, North and Shuffleberger hopped out, and the battle was still going on. And this was at a time one has to remember when U.S. military personnel in El Salvador were barred uh, from getting anywhere near a battlefield. Um, at least that's what they were technically not supposed to be doing. So North and Schaffelberger then find a couple of Salvadoran soldiers who are wounded and put them back on the, on the plane. And um, as North described it, uh, Schaffelberger was giving CPR to one of the guys in the back of the, and North was trying to get the plane uh, up in the air. And he said a gorilla hopped out from behind a bush and opened fire and blew the windshield out. But he was able to, you know, make takeoff speed on this little dirt road, and and he flew the plane back to Ilopango Airfield, uh, and one of the guys died on the plane, and the other Salvadoran soldier died at the airfield. So he took the story back to Ronald Reagan as an anecdote about the need for more um, military medical uh, assistance for El Salvador, and and Reagan had in fact waived the uh, the troop the 52 advisor limit in El Salvador to permit more um, uh, more medical training. So I couldn't write the story because I first I just didn't know if I should believe it. In fact, I really didn't believe it. And Shuffleberger was dead. It was it was it was virtually impossible to confirm. But it became clear to me that this was a man who was worth keeping an eye on. Uh, and as the troubles grew for the Contra program, we began to hear very early, since uh, at that time uh, the coverage we, I was doing and others, a few others were doing was very close to, to the people who were actually making the policy. We knew real time what was happening with that program. And one of the things we started hearing was that North was stepping in to sort of fill the void left by the uh, forced removal of the CIA personnel. Um, so that became something we were aware of, and even as the, the period of 84 were on, and, and uh, at that point uh, I was doing, I did the stories about the CIA manuals, um, uh, the sabotage manual, and also the, uh, this, what became known as the assassination manual. Let's, let's talk about those, what those manuals were and who was creating them and uh, what people thought when you started to report about those. I mean, you know, it's hard to believe that the CIA was uh, providing the Contras with uh, manuals to create martyrs and so on and so forth. Well, I think that's, that's right. It was, uh, but one has to remember when these things happened. Um, in 1983, the summer of 83 was a key period for the whole Contra operation. Casey realized that the war was not going to be won easily. Uh, the original plans for the victory by Christmas of 83, those plans were out the window. He needed to go in for the long haul. Uh, he needed a better trained uh, contrary force. He needed uh, more uh, trouble for the Sandinistas uh, at home, more economic dislocation, more sabotage, more problems. So the two manuals were drafted in that time period. The one, one was the comic book style manual, which, which urged the Nicaraguans to uh, put uh, put tax on the roadways to cause tires to blow out, to uh, put sponges in toilets to make toilets back up, uh, call in sick from work, a whole variety 
throwing Molotov cocktails at police buildings and so forth, a whole variety of sort of how to sort of mess up a country. Um, and they also, there also was this the psychological operations manual was put together for the Contra units to make them more effective at putting out their message. And much of it was fairly innocuous of that sort of, you know, how you make a, 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 an effective speech, how you use propaganda. Uh, but some of it was more sinister, uh, you know, how you create a martyr by having one of your own people get killed in a demonstration against the Sandinistas, uh, and then using that person's death uh, rather coldly and calculatingly to enhance your cause. Um, uh, and, of course, the most controversial part was how you use selective violence to neutralize Sandinista civilian officials, like judges or uh, town officials, and this was being this was being done at a time, remember, when it, when the Contras were executing on a fairly massive scale captured civilian officials. Uh, some people felt that one of the reasons for the manual was, in a sense, to get control of the Contras. You know, in other words, it was better to use selective violence than indiscriminate violence. So, you know, so it was argued at the time, when it was exposed in 84, that this was really a human rights initiative to prevent the Contras from being too, um, too violent uh, toward, these, uh, toward these civilian officials. Um, but, but that was part of the, of the overall package as we came to know it. Um, and these were embarrassing disclosures when they came out in 84. They, they followed the disclosures about the minings. Uh, I also wrote stories during this period about the sabotage raids along the coast. Uh, the town of Corinto was virtually destroyed when, uh, uh, when CIA personnel landed and blew up um, uh, the, uh, an, an oil depot. Uh, there were attacks on a number of um, oil pipelines. Uh, there was an effort to destroy the Sandinista, the Nicaraguan economy, to make it scream, as we might have said in a different historical context. Uh, and this was carried out very aggressively throughout this period. When these things were exposed, um, obviously it added to the pressure from in Congress to get to get some handle on this. I also wrote in late '84 about how CIA uh, helicopter teams were had actually engaged in combat with Nicaraguan forces in early '84 at Potosi and at uh, Puerto Sandino, if I remember right. Um, so we, we, we had situations where American military men were in combat in Nicaragua, and the effort was to contain and control it and cover it all up, keep it from the American people. And that, of course, was part of this, this need, this desperate need to control this false reality in Washington. Now, this reporting uh, that you were doing and some others were doing went a long way to uh, encourage the Congress to restrain what was going on in uh, Nicaragua and Central America. That was the, I believe, the origins of the Bolin Amendment. Well, yes, I think the Bolin Amendment was driven by several things. Uh, uh, first, the recognition of increasing human rights problems by the Contras, and this the expansion of the of the force. Uh, remember, Casey was first set telling people that this was, this was just to interdict weapons going to El Salvador. But it became clear to Congress that the real goal was something else, and it was. Uh, inside CIA records I reported during this time frame, there was actually a, a timetable, a plan for overthrowing the Nicaraguan government. This was, this, I, I reported this at a time when the official story was still that, this, that the goal of the Contras was to interdict weapons and possibly put some pressure on the Nicaraguans. Uh, the, the real goal was to, to impose a new government. So. Uh, so Congress did begin to get more and more concerned and more and more distrustful and took action. Uh, that forced uh, the White House's hand and it moved to setting up this private network. Okay, we're talking with Bob Perry, author of Fooling America. Early on, he was a journalist working with Associated Press and then with Newsweek, breaking stories around the whole Iran-Contra scandal. Now, Bob Perry, this is a scandal that had a number of CIA station chiefs involved in it. It had Alan Fires, I believe he was the Central American Task Force Chief. It had the Deputy Director of Covert Operations, Clara George, involved. It had, everybody knows, uh, William Casey could still be raising money from his grave for the Contras. Uh, he was clearly hands-on, as you've talked about, and as 
it's common knowledge now. So, and you have the support, the CIA was getting the support of the NSA through these safe communication systems. You had the DIA involved. This was an extensive intelligence operations operation. Why was it that when finally it came to uh, the congressional investigation, there was it was almost as if the CIA didn't even participate? Well, I think Iran-Contra can be seen as a series of cover-ups. Um, obviously, we talked about how the, some of the abuses by the Contras had to be covered up. Then, when North's operations sort of took over, raising money and providing military assistance, as you point out, with many CIA people collaborating and assisting him, that had to be covered up, because that was in violation of the law. Um, when, finally, after enormous amounts of work, um, a few of us uh, were began to expose Norse operation. Now we're in 1985, and that's when I do the first story about uh, identifying North and his operation. Um, the, my, the Miami Herald does a piece shortly after that, which makes similar points, but it's widely ignored. There, there is, there is a flurry in, in August of '85 where the New York Times does a piece without mentioning North's name. The Post matches it. Uh, the Washington Post matches it. So these things are out there, but the cover-up continues. These things are denied. They're not denied aggressively and attacked aggressively. Um, we keep, at AP, we keep reporting on it. Um, at this point, uh, Brian Barger has been brought on board at AP to work on these stories with me. Uh, we're making a determined effort to expose this story, uh, although Obviously, the AP had its moments where it tried to pull back and didn't want to go as aggressively as we thought it should. Um, we were doing some major stories throughout this period on aspects of this operation. That goes into 86, and uh, we find out in 86 that, um, in fact, the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami was also on to the North Network, and that's, that investigation was, was kiboshed. Um, by the summer of 86, we do another major story on North, uh, laying out with 24 sources how he used intermediaries, how he continued these oper this, this contra support activity in defiance of the law. In August of 86, in the face of all this reporting, the House Intelligence Committee, chaired by Lee Hamilton at the time, then goes over, rather grudgingly, I think, to the White House, sits down with North in the Situation Room, and asks him, are these stories right? North says they're not. They're totally false. Uh, other of North's superiors at the White House also deny it. And, and the House Intelligence Committee then comes back, and I get a call telling me that we've checked your stories out, and they're not right. These respectable men have denied them. At that point, and people sort of forget this, I think, uh, at that point, the the North story was dead. Uh, Barger at this point is sort of... Just because he denied it. Well, because the Democrats had now joined the White House, the CIA, and the State Department denying these stories. These were considered flaky conspiracy theories at that time. Uh, and to have Lee Hamilton and the Democrats say, these aren't true, put those of us who were trying to get at the truth in, in an extremely difficult, untenable position. Barger is pushed out at the AP at this time. He goes into freelancing. I give up really trying to do anything, as, as, uh, as other reporters working on it also pull back. It is, it, it is the conventional wisdom in Washington is so strong that these are all nutty stories that you would throw away your career if you pursued them any further. And in fact, uh, I tried that summer to get a number of publications, including some that are considered sort of liberal. Uh, like Rolling Stone, to run stories in this, and, and no one wanted to even hear it. It was considered completely off the charts. Bob Perry, why don't you just tell people exactly what the Bohemian Grove is? Well, the Bohemian Grove is an exclusive resort in Northern California, which every year has several weekends uh, when some of the most prominent men in America get together uh, with great privacy and meet. There's a play that's put on the last weekend of the, I think there are three weekends normally. There's a play that's put on. 
uh, it's a chance for the great and powerful to sort of let down their hair and and um, talk freely about uh, things that are of concern to them. Um, the, the the House Task Force accepts as fact that William Casey was at the Bohemian Grove on the last weekend in July 1980, and that therefore he could not have gone to a meeting in Madrid, as described by Jamshid Hashemi, who was a who was an Iranian arms dealer and an ex-CIA operative. Uh, the basic argument for the Bohemian Grove alibi, as laid out by the by the task force, is that Casey was there from on July 25th, 26th, and 27th. That he then leaves the Grove on, the, on July 27th, goes to San Francisco, and flies to London, where we know he arrives on July 28th for a uh, a World War II historical conference. Uh, he arrives there at about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So the committee says that because of that travel itinerary, the stories about Madrid must be a lie. Therefore, this is untrue. But there are some serious problems with this alibi. And basically, the problem is that all the documentary evidence establishes that Casey was actually at the Bohemian Grove August 1st to 3rd and was not there at all, on the West Coast even, the last weekend in July. And the story goes this way. Daryl Trent, who was a Republican activist in 80, uh, and Casey's host at the Bohemian Grove that year, is in Los Angeles on July 24th. That's the Thursday. He recalls flying on July 21st to San Francisco and then going to the Grove. He believes Casey was with him. He's not sure if it was that weekend or the following weekend, but he thinks it was that weekend. There are, at the Grove, we have now uh, dated bar tabs and time bar tabs, where, where, which Daryl Trent had signed, showing that indeed he was there on July 24th. However, Casey could not have gone with him on the 24th. Casey was in Washington at the Federal Election Commission on camera, picking up a matching fund check for the campaign. There are also documents showing that on that day, Casey was at the Metropolitan Club in Washington making phone calls. There are bills time dated bills for this. So Casey was here in Washington, not in Los Angeles or San Francisco that day. The next day, Friday, July 25th, Daryl Trent stays at the Grove. He has some more bar, bar tabs. He went skeet shooting that day. Casey has two meetings on his calendar that take place at the Republican headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, in the morning of that Friday. Although the task force has no evidence that Casey flew to the West Coast at all, they found, uh, they found a receipt, uh, a, a canceled uh, plane ticket, for the Washington to New York shuttle on that Friday, bought by Casey. It's one of those tickets that you buy, actually, when you're getting on the plane. So what they had was documentary evidence that he went from Washington to New York when he should have been already at the Bohemian Grove. On the next day, July 26th, the Saturday, Casey has another meeting scheduled with a woman named Tobin. This apparently is Mary Jane Tobin, who is a New York-based right to life advocate. And she confirms meeting with Casey at his home in Long Island, Roslyn Harbor, Long Island. So the evidence is consistent and clear based on documents, that Casey was actually on the East Coast during this time period. There's also a photograph that was taken of all the people, a group photograph of people who were at the Parsonage encampment at the Bohemian Grove on this last weekend in July. Daryl Trent's there. Some other people, friends of Casey's, are there. William Casey is not in the photograph. So there's no evidence at all that Casey was at the Bohemian Grove when the House Task Force insists he was. The House Task Force further has no evidence at all that he flew out of San Francisco. There are no plane tickets, no credit card receipts, nothing to place him on a plane from San Francisco to London. This is entirely speculation on their part. However, the following weekend, August 1st, Casey's calendar puts him in Los Angeles. There were notes that were taken by Richard Allen of a meeting that day in Los Angeles, 
which show that Casey and Daryl Trent, his Bohemian Grove host, were sitting together. So while it was impossible, based on the documentary record, for Casey to travel with, with Daryl Trent from Los Angeles to San Francisco the previous week, the two of them are together in Los Angeles on August 1st. So it's clear that that's when they would have gone. On August 1st, Daryl Trent arrives at the Bohemian Grove. Casey is charged for Bohemian Grove playbook for the play they put on on August 1st. Uh, and then to top this all off, there's a contemporaneous diary entry by one of the people who stayed in, in that same cabin, a man named Matthew McGowan, who was a San Francisco businessman. And Matthew McGowan, who had been there, who recorded each day he was at the Grove that summer, writes on August 3rd, the last day of the Grove encampment, that the Grove closed that day and that, and that uh, uh, Governor Reagan's campaign manager, William Casey, was our guest this last weekend. And even the House report acknowledges that on its face, uh, McGowan's diary entry would establish that Casey was there that weekend, but regardless, the House Task Force says we conclude that Casey was there the last weekend in July and therefore could not have been in Madrid. And to do that, they do two things. Well, first of all, they, of course, they throw out all the documentary evidence. All of it has to be false. They say that uh, the, 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 the bar tabs for July 24th that Daryl Trent signed must have been an error. Uh, they say that, uh, that, the, that Casey must have stepped out and gone for a walk when the photograph was taken. They say Casey must have canceled all his meetings for those two days, which put him on the East Coast. Uh, they go through and just throw out all the documentary evidence, as convincing as it is. Then they say, well, Daryl Trent recalled that Casey was heading to London when he drives him to the airport in San Francisco. And they make a big deal out of this, except they also mention in footnote 218 of the report, if you bother to read the footnotes, the context. Daryl Trent's testimony was that uh, he wasn't sure if he actually recalled the London reference that Casey had said it, or if he had just heard it recently and was adding it to his memory. So in other words, Daryl Trent acknowledges that he might have just factored in the London story because he'd heard about it recently, not that it was said at the time by Casey. This is stuck in a footnote that one has to sort of dig around to find. Um, there's also a claim that uh, there's uh, this, another person who was at the Grove that weekend, Bernard Smith, says he recalls seeing Casey with Daryl Trent. And, Darryl, and Smith was there just that one weekend in the last weekend in July. However, what they don't tell you in the report is that is that Smith, Trent, and Casey were all back at the Grove in 1981 together. So, so Smith's memory could very easily have been just a year off, and that's the kind of that's the kind of thing you would not remember precisely. And there's no, and Smith has no notes or anything to verify what year it was. So what the committee did was to be extremely selective in the evidence that they considered conclusive. When that evidence was actually very flimsy and dismissive when they were faced with really incontrovertible documentary evidence. Because of this pattern, Congressman Dimely of, of Los Angeles, uh, was a Democrat from Los Angeles, objected and wrote a, a dissent to this report, saying that he felt the, uh, the treatment of the evidence was selective and imbalanced. Um, Congressman Hamilton put pressure on Daimele to get him to withdraw the dissent, which Daimele finally did. Uh, Daimele refused to sign the report because of his concerns about um, the uh, selective use of evidence. So I think we, what you have here is a report that may have some very good points in it, and it may actually, much of it I might agree with in terms of criticizing some of the, the witnesses who uh, made allegations. But I think the report itself damages its credibility by uh, taking on these alibis, which are just not credible and not supported by the evidence at all. So here we come back again to Lee Hamilton, who we talked about in Iran-Contra. And now this is, once again, a very seasoned politician who is a Democrat, 
who is attempting to suppress, it sounds like, the thoughts, the concerns of a fellow Democrat. Well, how do you explain this? Well, I think I think Lee Hamilton wanted this unpleasant set of allegations, known as October Surprise, to go away. Um, obviously, it, this is a case where you have some pretty s uh, slippery characters making the allegations to begin with. These are not respectable men, quote unquote. Um, and you have you have the respectable men uh, from George Bush uh, through um, the Casey family to. Uh, Dick Allen and uh, Judge Larry Silverman and so forth, denying any involvement in anything improper. So you're sort of, you're put in a position, which I think uh, Congressman Hamilton has particular problems with, that is this idea that honorable people or respectable people might not tell you the truth. But like, look, Bob, we've got Oscar Arias, who was the Nobel Prize winner the moral president of Costa Rica, writing a letter saying, look, we are concerned about drug trafficking. We are concerned about assassinations. He didn't say this, but he clearly is uh, one of what we might call the respectable man. What happened? What, what, what was Lee Hamilton afraid of? Uh, that a somebody who was associated with the CIA might be convicted of drug trafficking and assassination, or what, was he was trying to do what? Uh, bring information to the American people, be a Democrat? I don't quite get it. Well, I don't quite get it either, quite frankly. But, uh, and I'm not defending, I'm not trying to defend uh, why uh, Congressman Hamilton would have written that letter to Oscar Arias or why he would have failed to get to the bottom of uh, the North Network and then the Iran-Contra scandal, and, and I think why he would accept uh, essentially bogus alibis for William Casey on something like the October Surprise. I, I do think that he, that he does see his, uh, his role as, in a sense, defending the integrity of the government. Um, and, I, I, and that is a, a, a view shared by many in Washington, not just uh, people in Congress, but also in journalism, that the American, that it's best for the American people not to know everything. That yes, some bad things happen, some things are done that maybe are necessary, they're kind of unsavory, uh, but if the United States acknowledged that these happened, or admitted they happened, or exposed that they happened, if the government exposed its own wrongdoing, that that would diminish uh, the American standing in the world, would cause the American public to doubt the institutions of the government. As a journalist, I disagree fervently with that position. I think it is the job of journalism, it's at its core, to inform the American people as best and honestly and fairly as we can what's going on. In a sense, we're like spies for the people. We sort of get into the government, we should look around, talk to a lot of people, and then report back to the people, what we find out. And I think if we do that, and if we do it well and, and fairly and honestly, the public can then act upon the government because it's armed with the information of what the government's doing. If it approves, it can say it approves. If it disapproves, it can say that. But our role is to act as that kind of honest broker for the information to go back. What's, what we've seen happen in recent years in Washington, it's not new, but I think it's accelerated, is this idea that the press is part of the elite, uh, that the press uh, understands what's going on but realizes that the public uh, isn't really ready for it, uh, that the press should therefore provide the information that would lead the public to support the government in its actions, but not provide the troubling evidence of sh that which might show that the government has, been, has gone seriously off track. And I think in the 80s, we really failed the public uh, as an institution, that is the press, by, by failing to simply tell the truth as best we could find it out. We instead acted more like uh, uh, press agents for the government than we did act. Bob Perry, one final question, which is sort of a more general question about conflicting stories, information, and why you would believe one thing and not believe another. Uh, let me just ask you this. We talk about the 
uh, Iran-Contra affair. Many people have received their information on Iran-Contra from the Christic Institute. Uh, Martha Honey and Tony Avergon, who are associated with them now, say no. That was a that was really quite unbelievable. It really wasn't to the point. The material wasn't correct. It was exaggerated. We have Barbara Honiger, who wrote the first October Surprise book. Somebody, a former aide, Ronald Reagan aide and White House aide, says that George Bush was in Paris, not William Casey. Um, uh, the counsel for the uh, the Congressional Committee for uh, investigating the October Surprise has quite a different view uh, than you have. Explain how you sort this out and why you would believe Casey's in uh, Paris or that there's a good chance and George Bush isn't and why the Christics might have not been telling the truth and uh, say Avergon and Honey in Costa Rica were closer to the truth. Well, I think it is. it has been very hard to figure out what to believe during this era. Um, you know, we have um, the people that you normally turn to to tell you the truth or expect to get the truth from, the people in the U.S. government, for instance, had a long record during this period of lying, uh, of not telling the truth, of covering things up, and then attacking people who tried to find out the truth. That doesn't, of course, mean that some of the um, uh, characters who show up and, and tell you all kinds of wild stories are telling the truth either. Uh, I just think it requires a tremendous uh, skepticism toward everybody. Um, there is some evidence is better than other evidence, however. As, as I went through in terms of like the so-called Bohemian Grove alibi, I think if you look at the documentary evidence, you would have no choice but to conclude, if you're an objective person, that Casey wasn't at the Bohemian Grove the weekend the House Task Force puts him there. That doesn't mean that I think he was in Madrid just because Jamshid Hashimi says so, either. Uh, I do think one has to approach these things as a journalist very, very skeptically. Uh, but you don't jump on, on one side or the other. What, what say made you doubt, what makes you doubt this n very long story in the Village Voice by Frank Snap saying that everybody that had anything to do with October Surprise has been uh, duped, is lying, is grinding an ax that uh, has more to do with their own desires than, than say, what really happened uh, in the October Surprise. Why, uh, Frank Snepp writes this long article. He's got a decent reputation. He blew the lid on what happened in Vietnam. What, what? Well, I think um, that article, I thought, was uh, had a number of serious inaccuracies that I knew about because uh, I knew many of, the, uh, many of the people involved. He particularly accuses a... Uh, a, a very able German correspondent, Martin Killian, who was then working for Der Spiegel, of, of acting in a, in a way where he was colluding with these witnesses. Uh, that is simply not supported by the evidence. It, it's, it was sort of a counter-conspiracy theory that Frank Snepp was putting forward to try to explain why a large number of people would uh, allege aspects to October surprise. In a way, you are stuck with that problem. If you don't believe that there were some contacts between Casey and the Iranians, you have to then explain why would so many people, even in many cases under oath, put themselves in jeopardy by saying there was. Um, SNEP tries to construct a, a conspiracy theory that goes the other way, that somehow the journalists got involved and, and there was all this somehow uh, people were doing this for whatever reasons. Uh, there is no evidence to support that. There is simply none. The, uh, and in fact, some evidence that he puts forward about the timing of who told Frontline uh, different parts of this, who were the witnesses who came forward first, he's completely wrong about because I happen to have been the reporter on that, and I know that, uh, that he reverses the order of events on some key, on some key details. Um, so I have to dismiss his account and that but then again that is not to say that i believe the these witnesses who claim there were october surprise meetings uh, but i just don't think we can dismiss this kind of uh, body of evidence on equally sh uh, shaky or false uh, evidence uh, i think one has to look at it as uh, as at this point a story that uh, we don't know the, the full truth on. I think the evidence would suggest, as the Senate came down on, uh, 
that there probably were some contacts between Casey and the Iranians, but that the evidence for a, a deal to delay release of the hostage is not supported in any way by the available material at this time. Uh, that, I think, is a fair position based on what, on what we know. Uh, but to go and just say nothing happened based on these alibis um, that don't hold up either is, is, uh, is sort of skewing the, the, the investigation the opposite way. And I think one has to be just very careful in this environment where propaganda, uh, where uh, disinformation, where uh, cover-ups have become almost a currency, almost a, a currency of public discourse in Washington, to jump to any conclusions uh, to either believe uh, wild-eyed conspiracy stories or to automatically debunk them. Uh, so uh, I would say that we, we have created a real mess for ourselves as a democracy uh, when you cannot trust the government and obviously the evidence of the last 12 years and, and really even before that would lead any sane person to conclude that the government's story must be treated very skeptically. But when you can also not trust some of these fringe people coming in with wild stories, um, how do you approach it? How do you try to piece it together? Then I think fair-minded journalists who try to get corroboration, who try to look for whatever documentary evidence might be available, our role is extremely important. If we then, if we jump to one side or the other automatically, uh, we further uh, foul the process. In a minute. Uh... In 60 seconds, where do you think the Christic Institute went wrong with their uh, investigation and their material? Well, I think there were two basic problems. One was that they pretended that uh, they had uh, dug up information that other people had found out. And uh, so they, in a sense, um, falsified the record by, uh, by putting themselves at the center of everything when when they really come into the game rather late uh, and, and, is, and falsely claim credit for much that happened. But worse than that was the framework of their, of their, of, of their uh, allegations. And that is that they had to write out the U.S. government because if the U.S. government were involved, they couldn't bring the suit. So the Christic pretended that this was a, pr a totally private operation. And even when people who worked for the government were doing things, even when U.S. equipment was being shipped places, it all had to be done privately. The U.S. government was operating maybe illegally, uh, but, it was, but these actions were being taken by representatives of the U.S. government from Oliver North to Ronald Reagan um, to people in the Pentagon and the CIA who were releasing the material. Uh, in a sense, the Christic bought the cover story that the White House was putting out that this was, this was a, a private operation. And for their own reasons, they bought the private operation cover story. It, it wasn't a private operation. It was a government operation. What would it mean to U.S. democracy, and what laws do you believe might have been broken if, in fact, the October surprise or aspects of it, some of the key aspects of it, were true? Well, again, um, since I don't know really what happened, it's hard to, to go into that. I, obviously, if, um, if there were any significant interference with the hostage negotiations, that is, if Casey, through his independent contacts with the Iranians, disrupted efforts to get them out, whether intentionally or not, um, that could be considered a serious um, uh, act of, of international treachery. Uh, collaborating with a terrorist state um, in a way that goes counter to the interests of the United States government. Uh, there are a number of laws, including treason, that could apply. Um, however, I think what, what uh, seems to have happened more likely is that Casey was seeking intelligence about what the Iranians were up to, what they knew, what they were likely to do with Carter, uh, and he may have made these independent contacts with them to discuss their demands and so forth. Uh, whether that would cross a line into breaking a law, I don't know, and I wouldn't be prepared to say here. 